hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are pleased to welcome you to the third week of the regional training on measuring SDG 16 goal in the Pacific. We would like to thank you all to join this training. My name is David Ravo. I'm methodology officer for the UNODC COSTAT Center of Excellence for Statistics on Crime and Criminal Justice in Asia and the Pacific. We are located in the Republic of Korea. I will have the pleasure to be the moderator today. As you know, this online training is part of a series of six webinars. It started on, it started on May 18th and will be finishing on June 22nd. The overall objective is to focus on tools and practices to produce data for indicators to monitor goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals on peace, justice, and strong institution. This training is a joint effort from UNODC, UNDP, OHCHR, UNESCO, UNICEF, ESCAP, and SPC, the Pacific Community. Today, Thursday, 1st of June, is the third session of our regional training on measuring SDG 16. And our agenda will be focusing on promoting the rule of law and access to justice, especially measuring violence with indicators 16.1.3 and indicators 16.3.1, measuring unsentenced detentions, uh, indicator 16.3.2, and measuring access to dispute resolution mechanism indicator 16.3.2. Before we proceed, the participants, I'd like to share some points. First, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that there are two different areas for communication. The question and answer box for you to ask questions to our panelists, as well as a chat box for general communication. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to please, please ask as many questions as you can during this session at any time through the question and answer box. Besides, we also would like to encourage you to register in the SDG 16 hub through the link that you can see in the chat or by using the QR code on the screen. Once logged in, you will be able to consult recordings, presentations, agendas, and you will be able to engage with experts and colleagues. On this regard, we would like to thank everyone for your participation on the SDG 16 Hub and for the extraordinary engagement. So thank you very much. Finally, we will be pleased to provide certificates for those participants who will have attended five out of six sessions. Now, dear participants, let's kick out uh, our webinar. To do so, um, we are going first to conduct together a poll in order to respond to a question about uh, SDG indicators 16.1.3 and 16.3.1 about measuring violence. Um, so colleagues, if you could please share the poll. Thank you. So uh, we have the, the question that I'm going to, to share. Do you believe that administrative records produced by police, prosecutor's office, judiciary, and other authorities are sufficient for us to identify the prevalence of violence. If you and so the first response is yes, I think it's enough. The second is I don't think it's enough. If you answer two, please feel free to write down which sources can be used on the chat. So we are going to leave you some time. Okay. Oh, yeah, responses keep keep coming. We're going to give you five seconds more. Okay, the poll is over. I'm going to share. Uh, okay, so the results: seventy-nine uh, percent of the participants responded that they don't think uh, the administrative records produced by the authority are sufficient to identify the prevalence of violence. Thank you very much. Um, with those points, points being mentioned, 
I would like to introduce our first panelist for today, Ms. Jisoo Kim, Data Analysis Officer from uh, Unity Kostat Center of Excellence for Statistics on Crime and uh, Criminal Justice in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, she will present on the topic Measuring Violence, SDG 16.1.3 and SDG 16.3.1. Uh, dear Jisoo, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, for introducing me. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so can you confirm me that all of you can see my screen? We no, don't. Okay. Uh, what about now? It's, now? Yes, yeah, we can see. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Yes, I see the whole result that, you know, most of you actually think that it's not enough. But some of you still think, think yeah, the ministry record is enough to actually identify the prevalence of violence. So today let's talk about a bit more detail. And if you know, if you answer like second, I don't think it's enough, please also share that what types of like other sources can be used for identifying the prevalence of violence. So please share your yeah, thoughts and opinion. And yeah, I'm gonna start my presentation. Okay, so yeah, as um, David already introduced me, my name is Shizu Kim. Yeah, here in, in Korea, like your NODC Coastal Center of Excellence. And if you have joined the previous two webinars, actually it's already our third time seeing each other. And I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to be part of like sessions every week so far. And I hope you have like found this webinar series informative and helpful and hope you find value in the one we'll be delivering today as well. Okay, so uh, in my presentation today, I will talk about two indicators, SDG 16.1.3, 16.3.1. Uh, so these indicators both focus on measuring violence, um, like addressing the prevalence of violence and the other addressing crime uh, reporting rate. So before we delve into these indicators, I would like to have some time to reflect on why we should measure violence and why these two indicators are so important in achieving the SDG, uh, like particularly goal 16. Okay. As we all know, it's quite obvious, you know, violence is bad and it is a problem. None of us wishes to experience violence, nor do we want our family, friends, neighbors, or you know, someone in our community to suffer from it. It's really clear, but let's just think about the precise negative impacts and its consequence in more detail. So first and foremost, violence impacts the health of not only those directly involved, but also those uh, who witness it. It can result in physical injuries that may lead to permanent disabilities, it can also result in mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder like PTSD. Furthermore, violence has a negative social impact. So individuals who have experienced violence may be hesitant to participate in regular social activities. So as a result, access to proper, a proper public services such as schools, healthcare facilities, and community support programs may become remitted. And the negative impact on the economy is also significant. Um, victims of violence often face the risk of work and income. Consequently, they found themselves trapped in a cycle of poverty. This not only affects individual lives, but also decreased productivity in society and increase in poverty and inequality, particularly among marginalized and vulnerable groups. So therefore, it is crucial that we make a continuous effort to eradicate violence through effective and inclusive policy making. And this can be only achieved with the support of strong evidence. And that is why we have to measure violence. Then the next question will be how to measure violence. So there are two main sources that can be used for this purpose. First is administrative records and survey-generated data. Administrative records for measuring violence 
are mainly generated through the criminal justice system. So these record, uh, records include information of like violent crimes, which are reported to or detected by the police or secure office or, or other law enforcement agencies. However, measuring the true prevalence of violence using only administrative records has significant limitations. So over the years, we have seen that many victims choose not to report their experience to authorities, or in some reason, they are unable to report their victimization to authorities. This means that the data from administrative records uh, to measure violence shows us only the tip of iceberg. We have found that in some country, like sometimes less than 10% of violence has been reported. So there are huge like hidden part here. So to overcome this limitation, surveys can be alternative way to discover this hidden part, so-called dark figure of crime. So conducting surveys allows us to directly collect information from general population based on their experience, even they have not reported it to authorities. So by ensuring anonymity and confidentiality, survey ena uh, enable us to capture a more comprehensive picture of violence, including unreported cases. So because of these two indicators that today I'm uh, introducing, prevalence of violence and reporting rate of violent crimes should be measured using data from sample surveys, especially victimization surveys. And there is another important reason why surveys are used as a method for measuring STG violence indicators. As already mentioned, victimization survey enable us to gather information on both reported and non-reported crimes. This provides insight into how many out of total who have experienced violence actually go to report it to police and seek justice, which is reporting rate. So if a reporting rate is low, it indicates that access to justice is not ensured for people in society and in your country. So it signifies that many crimes are not investigated and offenders are not punished. Moreover, a low reporting rate of crime distorts the true um, picture of like criminal activity, leading to inefficient allocation of resources. So the reporting rate also provides and can provide a measure of the confidence of victims in the ability of the police and other authorities to provide assistance and bring perpetrators to justice. Therefore, we should identify whether victims of violence in our society are receiving the necessary support as they deserve with these indicators, with this data. Furthermore, surveys provide also variable insight um, into the reason behind non-reporting of crimes. So now I hope we are on the same page and have a better understanding of the importance of measuring uh, the prevalence of violence and reporting rate of violence uh, using survey-based data. So as you can see on the slide, we have decided to measure these two indicators, 16.1.3 and 16.3.1. Yeah, addressing addressing uh, measure these two indicators, addressing three like forms of violence, physical violence, psychological violence, and sexual violence in the past 12 months as a reference period. And in addition to capturing the overall prevalence and reporting rate, we also encourage you to collect disaggregated data, such as type of crime, sex and age, income level, education, attainment, victim, perpetrator relationship, and so on. So now let's take a closer look at um, the indicators themselves. So SDG 16.1.3 can be defined as the total number of persons who have been victim of physical, psychological, or sexual violence in the previous 12 months as a share of uh, the total population. It can be computed by simply dividing the number of people who have been victims of violence in the previous 12 months by the total population, and then multiplying the result by 100. Yeah, of course, we collect this data from the like, survey. So maybe first we calculate these indicators um, among the sample, 
and then maybe we can estimate at the national level. And this like the same calculation applies to two sub-indicators, 1.3b, psychological violence, and 1.3c, sexual violence. So measuring sub-indicators separately provides more detailed insight to develop sophisticated and um, more relevant policies on crime prevention and criminal justice. And the next uh, indicators. So during victimization surveys, we first ask people if they have experienced any form of violence. If the respondent is identified as the victim of a particular type of violence, then we ask whether they have reported their victimization experience to the authorities uh, in the following questions. So based on the survey results, the indicators can be computed by, uh, as you can see on the slide like this, simply dividing the number of victims of physical violence, for example, who have reported to the authorities by the total number of identified victims of physical violence. So same as um, indicator 16.1.3, the same calculation applies to the two sub-indicators. And yeah, of course, it will give you more detailed information of their reporting rate of each violence. There's one more consideration that we need to address to measure violence. If we go to the field and ask people their violence experience, we cannot just simply ask, have you ever experienced physical violence or have you ever experienced sexual violence, no, we cannot do that. And people are not, people are not gonna giving like any answer. So there are many reasons not to ask in this way, but one of them is, you know, people may have different concepts and idea on how to define violence. So that is one reason uh, we cannot ask uh, these questions like this way. So that is why UNODC developed the ICCS, which was introduced on the first day of our webinar. So I'm not going to explain the ICCS in detail, but let me just highlight one thing, one like beneficiary of the ICCS. So since the concept and definition of crime in the ICCS build on behavior descriptions with detailed examples of behaviors. So it can be applied to our survey questions really, really like easily. Like for example, if you're asking the physical violence, we can give like many of the example to the respondent, like, like snapping, like pitting, these kind of detailed behaviors description um, can be used and is from the ICCS. So uh, based on the ICCS, like I said, yeah, you can find, you first find what kind of criminal acts constitute each form of violence. So for example, serious physical assault, a serious physical threat and robbery with the use of force can be considered as a physical violence. And it also provides a definition of each criminal act with various examples of behaviors, which can be considered as the criminal act. And these examples, uh, we provide the survey respondents, yeah, I would explain, um, with more clear and better concept of violence when they think about their experience. So it helps us to get more reliable answers. So please come to see and please uh, have a look at the ICCS. So finally, we have reached out and we have reached the last slide of my presentation. Today, we have discussed the prevalence of violence and reporting rates, as well as the importance of measuring violence. So what I want to say is, please invest in surveys, yeah. So investing in surveys, particularly victimization surveys, is crucial for measuring violence to monitor crime trends and evaluate crime prevention and criminal justice policies. So these surveys should be carried out on a regular basis, of course. So the yeah, UNODC is happy to support countries in implementing victimization surveys. Please feel free to reach out to us for any assistance. And if you like, want to discuss about victimization surveys or other concerns related these two indicators, also please yeah, contact to us. So I'm concluding here and thank you so much for listening to my presentation and joining today's webinar. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you yeah, once again. 
So, yep, over to you, David. Thank you very much, dear Jisoo. It was an extremely interesting presentation. I think it was really important to show how these indicates can be measured, as well as the tools. And it was really interesting to clearly explain the different aspects of violence. Thank you very much. I think it was really clear. Um, now, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our next panelist, uh, Mr. William Mill, Director of the National Center for Crime and Justice Statistics, Social Statistics Division of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, Mr. Mill will present about the national experience on measuring violence from Australia's perspective. Please let's welcome Mr. William Mill to join. Mr. M Mr. William, uh, please uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me along to this webinar. Um, can everyone see my slides before I get yes, moving? Yes, we, we can. Progress. Excellent. So I just, I'm gonna, I've got 10 minutes to talk to you very quickly about um, who we are and what we do, but with a particular focus on our crime victimization survey. So I wanna look at that, about what the crime victimization is, crime victimization survey is for us, uh, and then look at some of the methods we use in undertaking that survey. And then I'll show you how that relates to the SCG goals 16.1.3, um, which is the physical, sexual and robbery for us. So I'll bring that into this um, discussion and also the police reporting for that. So I'll show you some quick stats at the end, but um, if we run out of time, I can easily move along. Look, for context, I just thought it'd be useful to show who we are. So I look after a centre called the National Crime and Justice Statistics Centre. We produce statistics from not only administrative data, so from police, criminal courts and corrective services, but also we collect two surveys. So a few weeks back, my colleague, Anthea Saflikos, presented to you our personal safety survey, which is the violence against women equivalent in the region. So um, this is our other collection, which is the crime victimization survey. Um, and thanks to uh, Jisoo for mentioning that, that the, the, between the administrative and the survey data, they complement each other, they're not substitutes. As you know, the police statistics give us really good information on how police are, police are reporting offenders and victims, whereas the surveys allow us to look beyond the, the police reporting and see what's not getting reported to police. Um, so what I want to do now is focus all entirely now on the, our crime victimization survey and what it is. So I'll give you some of the high level um, characteristics of this one. We've been running this annually since 2008. So we have an extremely good time series on uh, these particular crimes. It's a really small, small module. So it doesn't take a great deal of time to complete. But we cover both personal crimes and household crimes. So you can see a range of personal crimes up there from physical assault to sexual assault and robbery. But we also look at household crimes um, like break-ins, motor vehicle theft and theft from motor vehicles and malicious property damage, which is always a really interesting one from a domestic violence perspective. Um, what I think, what, what's really cool about this survey is two things. We all, not only do we collect the, sort of the, the, the numbers of these crime types, we also look at the characteristics of, of this. So, one of the ones that's really interesting is people's perceptions of whether they thought drugs or alcohol were involved in the crime. So that's that when they thought the perpetrator was high or drunk at the time. Uh, and we also look at the relationship to perpetrator, which is really important. So we can have a, a good understanding of whether the perpetrator was a known person, a stranger or an intimate partner. And of course, I mentioned before, the other really, really critical part of this is around reporting to police. And I know our police departments look at this particular statistic all the time to see whether they're having a better effect at getting more people coming to their to their um, aid. Um, the other really good thing about this is the profile of the victim. So we've got some really good demographic or socio-demographic information about people. So we've got things like age, sex, employment, education, income, and we do output by those categories as well where we can, where the data holds up. Um, and these are extremely, extremely useful understanding who's most impacted by these crime types. So it's really good to get they got these, these really good characteristics data as well as the profile data. So it's a lot of stuff in there for a very short survey, but I thought I'd just focus on how we conduct it because it's, sorry, I've got a bit of a wrong justification there, but the scope, is, the scope of our crime victimization survey is persons aged 15 and over living in a private, private setting. So we don't go into hospitals or motels or hotels. It's purely they're going to be living in a, in a residence. In terms of how we find these people, we, the ABS has this very, very um, 
clever piece of infrastructure. It's called the address register and, and it's a list of all uh, addresses in Australia, including private dwellings and other, other, um, other uh, address types. So it could be business location, it could be other things as well. That is our principal frame source for any social survey we collect, like the crime, like the crime victimization survey, but also the census. So the census uses the frame source. We also use the census to update the frame. So when we run it every five years, we get new addresses in there, which we update through this. Um, and we use new building approvals to update that frame. So it's a dynamic piece of um, statistical framework and of off frame for survey purposes. And yeah, it's really just an expensive undertaking to build, but once you've got it, once you've got it built, the updating is relatively simple. Our sample selection for this is based on geographic locations. So Australia's split into eight geographic um, fields of states and territories with different population shares. We make sure we sample enough from each of those states and territories so that we can A, produce a national perspective, but also produce a, a perspective for the state and territory. And we got about 28,000 households and interviewed them for this survey. Interestingly, it's only a two minute on average survey. It takes absolutely no time at all. Once they get going, it might be, you know, it could almost be a minute for what some people and it could be four, five, 10 minutes for others, but that's very, very short. We use telephone interviewing for this one, um, which is a lot simpler than personal interviews and a lot cheaper. And the enumeration period is a 12 month period. So if every time we release it, it's based on the last 12 months. Um, when we get to the actual end of the, the processing cycle, we use population weighting to make the, um, the collection nationally representative. So we not only use the benchmarks by geography, we always we also use the benchmarks for um, age and sex. And that way we can remove any potential bias, reporting bias we get from particular geographic regions or particular cohorts of individuals. So we can weight them differently to make sure that they are representative of the population at the time. I thought now I'd quickly just turn attention to some of the, the, the part of the end where we start to look at how we get this data into the public domain. We undertake a whole series of um, pieces of work to do this. Validation is a very critical one at the top of the, the pile there. And what we're talking about in validation is you've got your system built that's creating your estimates. We get someone to run that and then they, we look at those for consistency, but then we get another person to run that identically, completely independent of the first run. And we look at the two sets of results to see if we're getting consistency across. And if we're not, then that triggers a, a, a bit of an interrogation on what's going on, what, what's happening. And then we might have to put some fixes in and run it again. And, and that third run, we're still looking for those um, consistencies in the, in the, in the runs really in critical piece of work needs to be done. Don't underestimate the time it takes to do it if you haven't done it before, but it is vital that you do that so you can understand where, where your problems might be in the data and resolve them before they go into the public domain. The next really critical part about before dissemination is to confront our data sources with other, other data sets, whether they're internal to us or whether they're external. And what we're looking at there is we're trying to work out whether our data conforms with other data sets, whether the, the movements are in the same direction, not necessarily magnitude or size, but just in the right direction. And or things like the, the uh, proportions are the same or in a similar kind of pattern. And it's not to say that, that they have to be identical, it's purely just to sort of, we get a bit of a hand on heart that what we're actually producing does actually conform with other things. But if it doesn't, then that sort of triggers another whole raft of investigations to make sure that we understand why it does or it doesn't conform. And that's really important because when we go to actually this approvals process, we need to be able to tell the story to our senior management at the ABS about what we found in the data, what are the key stories, but how it actually relates to other data sets and also the real world. So this is where we can do some fairly cool stuff and trying to make sense of the data. We can't publish that, it's purely internal purposes, but we can sort of talk, talk it through about whether we think the data is moving in general terms about a particular event in the population or um, a particular instance. So this COVID was a big one. We've had a lot of issues, uh, high profile issues in Australia for some crime types, which that tends to help understand what's, what, how people are reporting in this survey. Dissemination, um, now I won't dwell on this because that's pretty obvious, but we cater for a range of audiences in our dissemination. So we have the media, sort of the very simple end who want 
really quick media grabs of information uh, right to the more sophisticated uh, researchers and users who want to get into the, the, the really detailed data, so the data tables, and or they might come to us for special data services and different cuts of this data, so which we wouldn't normally publish. So um, there's a whole raft of them, and it's really important that we try and try and um, meet the needs of a, a broad range of, of users. So that's that's all I want to cover on the validation. I thought, well, I, I think I still have a few minutes left. I thought I'd just cover off our, how this relates to those sustainable development goals in terms of our data outputs. So in terms of physical assault, um, the personal, uh, personal safety, sorry, the victimization, victimization survey found that about 2% of persons experienced physical assault in 2021-22, um, which that relates more men and women probably equally likely to experience physical assault. So the numbers look a bit different, but statistically they're not different at all. And the rate of reporting to police, um, 52% reported their most recent incident to police. And that's um, that was uh, one of the other questions we have in the survey is to ask people why they didn't report to police. So there's a bit of a, a, a bit of an extra piece there and there. And we found that a lot of the people in that in that 48% that didn't report thought the matter was too personal or they could deal with it themselves. So it's really, really handy to have an understanding why people are coming to police and police use that statistics, those sort of statistics well to understand what it is, whether it's a trust issue with them or whether it's something else that they, that's going on. So really, really interesting piece of additional information we can get out of that one. So on the sexual assault, second to last slide, um, we had about point four, half a percent of persons experienced sexual assault in 21, 22. But when I, when I looked at the um, women's experiences, um, nearly 1% of women experienced sexual assault in the last 12 months, and that was about 92,000. So there wasn't a lot happening. Um, There's about 2,000 plus of men, but not much more. The reporting rate for sexual assault for police was 16% for women. Um, we couldn't actually get one for men because of the low prevalence rates for men's crime. The statistic on reporting was even much lower and the much wider discrepancy in terms of the, um, the error rates. Um, I was going to point out that 1% of women, this is where it gets really interesting when you look at some of the profiles of, of, of people. And when you start looking at the younger cohorts, that 1% uh, for 18 to 29 year olds is actually 4%. So this is where it gets really important to try and break this down into small subgroups to try and understand what's driving these statistics, who's most impacted. Um, not only to understand your statistics, but also from the service and justice responses as well. It's so yeah, if you can, we can get these collections breaking down to more, you know, socio-demographic information. It's really, really critical to try and understand what the drivers are behind these things. The final one, population of, uh, that's affected by robbery, very small crime type in Australia. It's only 0.3%, not much different for men and women. And the reporting rate is about 45% to police. Just an interesting fact, one of the other pieces of information we get is location of um, incident and not surprisingly for robbery, it's usually a non-dwelling location. So that's about, I think it was about 65% were non-dwellings. So that was my slideshow to wrap it up. Um, thank you for having me. In the, in the slide pack, I do include a few slides on the collections we, we produce. Uh, the crime victimization sitting under annual collections, um, but there's also a whole raft of other collections from the administrative to the less regular personal safety surveys and analytical articles, and also some of the frameworks we use to actually guide our collections. So thank you for having me. I will be quiet from here and hand back to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ilmin. It was an excellent presentation on the Australian perspective on measuring violence. Uh, we are now pleased to uh, have our next panelist. Her name is uh, Gurnar uh, Kudai Vergenova. She is National Project Officer based in the UNODC Regional Office for Central Asia. Uh, Ms. Gurnar, please uh, over to you. Uh, good day, dear colleagues and dear participants. Let me share my screen. Wait a minute. 
Uh, I cannot share my screen. Could you please uh, present presentation, my presentation from your site? Now you should be able to share. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. If you could expand it, uh, it would be much better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, now it's better. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, um, I'm very privileged uh, to be here today. And uh, I would like to tell you uh, that with the support of you know, DC COSTAT, uh, we conducted an uh, international crime victimization survey in Uzbekistan. Uh, the, our country is very beautiful. This is a mix of modern and ancient cities. Ancient cities uh, start their history from the ninth century. And I see there are a lot of people from many, many parts of the world. And, all of you are most of welcome to visit our countries and enjoy our ancient cities. So uh, by our information, um, first international crime victimization survey, ICVS, was uh, conducted by UN agency. This is United Nations Inter-Regional Crime and Criminal Justice Institute in Rome in 1989. Uh, but of course, as my colleagues uh, already mentioned, um, national crime victimization surveys started their histories long ago. By uh, information from one source, I found that in United States, they started to find national crime statistics in 1929. And in 1960s, 70s, uh, United States launched their first national crime victimization survey. What is the uh, purpose of a victimization survey? Uh, this aims to measure the levels of common crime in a comparative international perspective, independently from the police administrators. ICVS is a valuable source of information to policymakers to understand the level and nature of both personal and household crimes, as well as people's perception of safety in the community and their confidence in law enforcement agencies. By our information, International Crime Victimization Survey was conducted in more than uh, 75 countries across the world. And many countries uh, do it uh, on a regular basis and included it in the, into the, uh, uh, their national assessments. If uh, tell in the simple word, uh, for what we need uh, International Crime Victim Survey, we can measure how much crime is there and what its characteristics. What are the characteristics of victims and perpetrators? Also, we can find out how the level of crime changes over time. And what are the risks of the, in the society of becoming a victim? Uh, recently, uh, victimization survey was also conducted in Kyrgyz Republic, Kazakhstan, Georgia, and Uzbekistan. This is uh, we, our country. In our country, we conducted uh, a victimization survey in cooperation with law enforcement agency of the Republic of Uzbekistan. And we used a standardized methodology of the International Crime Victim Survey. For these purposes, uh, together with Law Enforcement Academy, we created a group of academics and representatives of the national institutions, leading national experts in the field of the criminology. And also under the monitoring of international experts, this is professional, uh, Professor uh, Jan van Dijk and Professor John van Kesteren from the Netherlands. They guided the process. Uh, through the competitive process, uh, we hired a local research company, Inter Research, uh, which conducted interview among a representative sample of over 3,000 respondents randomly chosen from the local population from Fergana, Andijan, and Namangan provinces. All these provinces are located in Fergana Wally. Fergana Wally, this is a geographical area uh, which uh, cover um, three countries. This is Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And we conducted uh, our survey on the part of Uz Uzbekistan. Uh, we used interview mode uh, PAPI, pen and paper personal interviews. Uh, why uh, we did it? Uh, because it was, um, 
we started to do it in the pandemic. It was 2020, and it was uh, uh, movement within the country uh, was restricted. Uh, you know about it, and uh, we uh, and this local company who conducted the research was they had. Uh, some local branches uh, in Ferganavoli, and that's why uh, they uh, printed uh, their papers by themselves and conducted interview. Uh, we uploaded the results of the victimization survey on our website, you know, DC website, you can see link here and you can uh, use it and can review it and uh, read by yourself. We uploaded on three languages. Our uh, government language is Uzbek, also, we prepared uh, some, one version in Russian and one version in English languages. Uh, in total, a questionnaire have, uh, six, has six sections. First section, it is an opinion about crime, uh, crime problems plus, addi plus additional offenses. Also, we gathered uh, personal and household information. Uh, here in a survey, we monitored situation uh, for five years of victimization. Uh, also, uh, this questionnaire includes details of victimization. Uh, questionnaire also uploaded on our website, both a three versions, and you can also review it if you will be interested. Uh, next session, it is uh, contacts with the police, and uh, we have in this questionnaire a separate section for violence against women. We understand that this section is very, how to say, sensitive, and that's why we conducted this session. Uh, we prepared um, our interviews, prepared everything, put in the closed envelope, and uh, gave it uh, to women respondents. Uh, as uh, my colleagues just so mentioned, uh, part of data collected uh, can be used to monitor uh, progress uh, in within the implementation of goal uh, 16. Uh, and also uh, goal 16.1.3 and goal 16.3.1 also could be measured. Uh, just a single uh, note I would like to send as uh, say you that psychological violence, uh, it is a bit challenging measure to uh, changing indicator to measure. And, um, physical violence and sexual violence uh, were measured uh, during our victimization survey. Uh, this is a key findings. Uh, our key findings, um, uh, we found out that the level of satisfaction of reporting victims with uh, police is uh, very low. And also we find out that um, road accidents are a major cause of serious injuries uh, in Fergana Valley. And chances to be referred for treatment in a hospital because of road accident in many times higher than as a result of the violent crime. And uh, really, uh, this is um, a real data. I, I also can be witnesses that in many cases, uh, road safety in our country uh, need uh, to be uh, an improvement. And also, uh, we found out that a major facilitating factor of violent crime appears, appears to be alcohol abuse in the families, uh, in particular by men. Uh, after the um, survey, we, uh, after the evaluation of the uh, data, we provided some uh, recommendations. And our law enforcement uh, agency, uh, they recommend uh, to introduce some uh, service-oriented uh, policing, community policing uh, to in our country and improve strengthening support to victims, in particular women, also are very important in our country. Also, uh, we find out that we need to address uh, better road safety programs and responsible drinking patterns, therefore, ought uh, to form part of crime prevention efforts and uh, evidence-based programs to prevent violence against uh, women and children are also recommended. Uh, the level of victimization of women by sexual accidents uh, was found to be low, certainly in an international perspective, but uh, we find out that um, this part of uh, survey, which related to uh, women, 
it's, it's a very sensitive. And I would like to recommend to countries who are going uh, to do victimization survey to take uh, some measures in order to obtain a real data. Uh, also, um, we think that awareness raising programs following international best practices in the area of gender quality, equality and women's empowerment are very high demanded. And uh, by recommendations of our national partner, law enforcement agency, the victimization survey should be repeated uh, to determine possible uh, ways uh, upward trends in five years in, in, in one year rates of victimization. Our lesson learned, um, uh, like a following, challenging for collecting the data on the indicators in the part for the questionnaire for female respondent due to puppy and the cultural S aspects. And also ICVS item on violence uh, do not cover, as I mentioned before, psychological violence, but that concept is very difficult to measure anyway. And um, by our experience, we would like to recommend a better to use uh, copy computer-based assisted personal interviewing or computer assistant web interviewing. We consider that uh, this uh, interviewing will be more qualitative, uh, especially computer-assisted web interviewing, because in this case, uh, our respondents uh, will be more open. Uh, as... Omar, sorry, could you please wrap yeah. up? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, yes I can share my presentation uh, for, uh, for organizers, and they can share with all participants. And also, uh, I would like to say that in our country, we find out that the most uh, pressing issues, this is a consumer fraud, cheating, bribery, and road accidents. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, to all colleagues, to all participants, and I wish you good luck. If you would like to conduct uh, a, a international victimization service, you, you can refer uh, uh, to my colleagues, to DSU, so you can refer to University Kostat and to us, and we will be very helpful uh, to help you uh, to provide you practi practical uh, maybe recommendations. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Gulna, for this great presentation. It was really interesting to see the different partners of ICVS in Uzbekistan. Thank you so much. Great, great. Um, now, dear participants, uh, we are going uh, to uh, have together a second poll. Um, in order to respond to one question about our next uh, session on SDG indicator 16.3.2 and sentence detainees. Uh, so the question is the following, please fill in the blank. The share of unsentenced detainees in the Pacific has increased, decreased or stayed the same between 2000 and 2019. We are going to leave you some, some seconds to, to respond. Okay, I think we have collected sufficient uh, responses and uh, so we can share the results. So according to uh, the participants, uh, the, the vast majority, 79% has selected that the share of unsentenced detainees in the Pacific has increased over the last 20 years. Thank you very much. Um, now we will move on uh, to our next session about measuring 16.3.2 uh, with my colleague, uh, Ms. Hansel Jung, uh, Program Assistant from University Kostat Center of Excellence. Uh, Ms. Jung will give uh, insight about measuring and sentence detentions, SGD indicator 16.3.2. Dear Hansel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and hello, everyone. My name is Hansel Zhang, and I am the program assistant at UNRDC Costa Center of Excellence. Thanks a lot for joining the webinar today, and I'm very honored to give a presentation today on SDG indicator 16.3.2 on sentence detention. 
So without further ado, let's dive right into what SDG 16.3.2 indicator is about. The SDG 16.3.2 measures unsentenced detainees as a proportion of the overall population, and unsentenced detainee refers to persons held in adult and or juvenile prisons, penal institutions, or correctional institutions who are untried, pretrial, or awaiting a first instance decision on their case from a competent authority regarding their conviction or acquittal. Persons held before and during the trial should also be included in the measurement. However, and of course, sentenced persons held awaiting the outcome of an appeal in respect of verdict or sentence or who are within the statutory limits for appealing their sentence should be excluded. According to data matter that UNODC published in 2021, we can see the global trend as well as the regional trend on the share of unsentenced detainees. When we first take a look at the trend line in 2000, it stood at around 30.9%, and as of 2019, the most recent estimates suggest that it is still at around 30.9%. What this global figure, however, highs to some extent is different regional trends. So when you take a look at bar graphs, for example, the African region, you see a significant improvement over the last 20 years, a reduction from around 45% down to roughly 35%, almost a 10% reduction. Whereas in Oceania, we can observe a steady increase in the share of unsentenced detainees in the last two decades, around 20% in 2000, 24% in 2010, and approximately 33% in 2019. So now we will talk about how we can measure the share of unsentenced detainees. SDG 16.3.2 is one of the indicators based on administrative data, and in many cases, your countries will already be collecting this data as a standard procedure. So if you have data on prison, please submit them to us. The main data providers are the National Prison Authority through UN Crime Trends Survey, an annual questionnaire that UNODC sends out to the member states, which you might have already heard about it in our previous sessions. And the indicator is computed as the total number of unsentenced persons held in detention divided by the total number of persons held in detention on a specified date by means of a cal calendar year or 12 months. I would like to show you the module in UN Crime Trend Survey specifically dedicated to prison statistics. As you can see here, we recommend that disaggregation data on these prison populations are collected along with sex, male or female, and age status, juvenile or adult, as well as the length of unsentenced detention to understand more what types of people are in the status of pretrial detention. Using the most recently available data at the global level, we see that around 30% of detainees are held without having had access to the trial. This share hasn't improved much more, uh, much over the last two decades. So another way to put this is for every three prisoners worldwide, one remains without access to justice. And using the disaggregation variable that I showed in the UN Crime Trend Survey just before, we can observe that the risk of unsentenced detention is somewhat higher amongst the female prison population, 36% as of 2020, and compared to male prison population, 30%. The unsentenced detainee data is invaluable as it captures the efficiency of the criminal justice system and signifies overall respect for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 9, Paragraph 3, that is, shall not be general rule that persons awaiting trial be detained in custody. Now, I would like to give you a snapshot of global prison trends over the last 12 decades using annual data collected from the UN Crime Trends Survey. As you can see from the blue line above the trend graph, the global prison population grew roughly in line with the global population growth between 2000 and 2019. 
What I would like to highlight in this graph, however, is that in 2020, we could observe a reverse trend in the global prison population, a decrease of almost 4.7%. The available evidence suggests that this reduction in the prison population was related to emergency releases, as well as the reduced intakes of new prisoners due to court delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Although cross-national uh, cross -national evidence on the reasons behind this reduction at the global level is quite limited. Now, when we take a look at the global, unless, uh, global unsentenced detainee population, the yellow trend line below you see in this graph, we can observe the share of prisoners who are held in detention without being unsentenced, without, without being sentenced for a crime, or the share of unsentenced detainee has remained relatively unchanged at the global level, despite the dramatic reduction in the global prison population record, uh, recorded during the first year of COVID-19 pandemic. Approximately 3 million people globally held in prison without sentence. Also, according to UNODC COVID-19 guidance note findings, on the basis of the information available, it appears that emergency release mechanisms in the vast majority of member states were focused on convicted persons rather than on pretrial detainees. This is likely because instruments commonly used to release prisoners are pre-existing constitutional or executive powers, for example, uh, pre presidential or royal pardons, which typically apply only to convicted prisoners. Moving on to the next slide, um, I would like to highlight that there are also some important difference between the reasons in year-on-year -year change in total persons held in prison. For example, as you can see here, in Europe and Northern America, there was quite a significant drop in prison numbers compared to previous years, whereas other reasons, for example, Latin America and the Caribbean did not show uh, or experience a reduction, but an increase in 2020. And when it comes to the Pacific region, Australia and New Zealand had a similar reduction at the global level, around 4.4% 4, 4 reduction, whereas there has been a slight increase in Oceania by 0.2%. The data coverage of SDG 16.3.2 in comparison to many of other indicators we've talked about is relatively good at global level. But as a way forward, I would encourage member states and prison authorities to use the International Classification of Crime for Statistical Purposes, the ICCS, as the blueprint to collect prison statistics and to use the UN Crime Trend Survey as a guidance to provide data on the most relevant disaggregation variables, including the status of detainees, whether they are sentenced or unsentenced, their age and sex, and the length of detention. Uh, here, I would like to share with you some documents that are pertinent to prison statistics. UNODC Data Matter Series 1 and 4 particularly cover issues related to prison, as well as the unsentenced detainees. If you'd also like to know more about the prison population and issues related to Asia and the Pacific, please refer to the regional snapshot series on prison population available at the UNODC Costa COE homepage and the QR codes provided in this screen now. The links will be shortly shared in the chat box, so please feel free to visit and then refer to these documents. And this actually brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, David. Thank you very much, Hansel, for this great presentation. It was really interesting uh, to see the original snapshots also to mention it in the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, dear participants, uh, it is now time to go through another poll. So as you can see, we like poll. Uh, so let's get, let's get us ready to read the question. So it's a question with multiple response. Um, it's a, no, a question, uh, there is no correct and incorrect question. Did you experience a dispute uh, in the last two years? And if so, which kind of dispute? Uh, so there is problems with land or buying and selling property and issues with housing. 
neighborhood disputes, trying to resolve family issues, seeking compensation for injuries or illness. And there is also problems with employment uh, or labor, uh, problems with government payments and problems with government and public services other than payments, problems with the other goods and services, issues with money, debt or financial services, environmental issues affecting you or none. So we are going to leave you some additional seconds. Okay, we, I think, yeah, we can close the, the poll. Let's close the poll. Thank you very much. Uh, so we can share the, the results. So uh, as you can see, um, I can't see well everything, but I, I have 45% uh, I've mentioned that trying to resolve family issues, 25% uh, um, problem with land or buying and selling property and issue with housing. Okay, so um, we are now moving to our next session about measuring access to dispute resolution mechanism uh, on this specific topic. I'm pleased to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Maria Neves, a governance study specialist who works for UNDP Oslo Government Centers. Uh, let's welcome Ms. Neves to join us. Ms. Neves, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you, colleagues, who who shared the poll. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see perfectly. Thank you. That's wonderful, and I'm just going to. Um, and you can see the deck correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We can. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, that was a very interesting. Sorry, Maria. Sorry, Maria. Yeah, we can see the the whole slide, so that is slides on the next slide. If you could only share the, the current slide. Oh, the the that okay. Yeah. Sorry, colleagues, I'll be sharing again. No problem. Uh, now. Mm. You okay? Yes, perfect. Yes, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so the thank you for the colleagues who presented before me. That was very interesting. Um, for this indicator, I'll be presenting now the access to dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, before I start actually going through the indicator, I think it's very important to, to inform that this is the newest, one of the newest indicators in the SDG framework. Uh, so 1633 was only adopted in 2020 in the comprehensive review. So for Pacific, where you selected uh, some indicators from the framework, 132, if I'm not mistaken, this was done in 2018 uh, or 17. I'm not completely sure of the date, the exact date, but it was before. Uh, the adoption of this indicator. So this is not one of the indicators that was selected in the region. Nonetheless, it is a very important indicator and it is a kind of a twin indicator to the one presented by Jisoo Kim. So 1633 measures access to dispute resolution mechanism. It has three agencies that support on this uh, indicator which are UNDP, UNODC, my colleagues uh, who presented before, and OECD. So on one side, we have 1631, um, the indicator or the experience of violence. Then we have 16, uh, 1613, then 1631, which is on the violence reporting. All of this is on the criminal side. 1633 is on the civil side. So it's not going to measure um, offense. What it actually is going to measure is disputes. So in, in this case, you are not going to focus on the ICCS, which is a very, very, very powerful tool uh, to help us harmonize uh, the crime statistics. So this is not using the ICCS because we're not actually going to focus on crimes, but we're going to focus on the dispute. And it is for this purpose is understood as a justifiable problem between individuals or, uh, or individuals and an entity 
and it can be seen as probably given reason to legal issues, whether they are perceived as being legal by those who, who face them, and whether any legal action was taken because of the problem. Overall, the indicator understands that uh, we have very important party, and we already have considerable work done in creating the indicators on the violence side, but we have this other side on the civil side that has this huge impact in our lives um, because they change, they can change our, our livelihoods, they can change the well-being of our households. Um, and as we can see, it's not actually rare uh, occurrences. We have we have around uh, fifty uh, colleagues on this call, on this webinar. And we had uh, around 20 that said that they had experienced some type of disputes just the last two years. So this, we are all somehow affected either with our neighbors or sometimes it's uh, disputes with, uh, with, uh, with our employers. So this indicator is this again. First thing is it is focuses on this, uh, this dispute on a time frame. So it's only measured the last two, 24 months. Because although it is uh, it occurs with certain frequency, it's still not a very common. So we need to increase the time frame to two for the twenty four months to two years. Is going to try to assess the unmet legal need and access to justice. So we're trying to measure who has access, but most importantly, also who has not accessed uh, the justice system. And it also identifies some problems that we have on resolving uh, legal issues. Uh, and in addition to it, in recognizing that not all problems that we experience go through the legal system, it also monitors both the formal and the informal mechanisms. So the both sides of it. The way the indicator actually uh, operates, it has uh, four sets that is asking. The first set is just to know, it was the more or less the first question that you answered. Uh, did you experience a dispute in the last two years? But this is because this is very broad, it's going to break it down by type of dispute. The same way that for 16, uh, 16, 1, 3, it breaks it down. You cannot only compute experience violence very generally, you have to break it down to the physical violence, sexual violence, psychological violence. So here is not these. It is a very a set of uh, disputes that I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, once we have this, then we're going to uh, try to understand if the access to the, the, any dispute resolution. So you have experienced the, the dispute. Now, have you accessed any type of mechanism? Have you seeked support to any type of mechanism? And the last one is uh, why then you did not seek, in the case for those who did not seek support. Um, there was a question in the Q&A asking uh, um, why was, why we're, uh, why the certain crimes are not reported or are they are reported but not registered. So we don't actually collect at that level because that's at the level of the person registering the, the offense. And this is only, only captures what's accessing the, the judicial system. So with the survey, we are also actually trying to assess what's not entering the judicial system. So we ask for several reasons, which be among them, it can be distrust to authorities, for instance. So on the disputes, exactly, we have this certain groups of disputes. So there are 10 groups of disputes that the indicator asks. Uh, in some countries, you might have additional disputes. Um, it's already we already started. So in those cases, it is advised that the, this dispute is regrouped in one of those. The type of disputes, of course, will always uh, change a bit from country to country. The ones that are going to be the most uh, frequent. Uh, one of the recent survey that we had, for instance, the environmental damage was one of the most experienced 
uh, disputes. Uh, you also, in some cases, the government payments. Um, it is very important when uh, implementing the survey that also you consider when you you contextualize to your specific country. And I, I can give an example why this. So for one specific country that we had, for most of the population, they did not understand that, um, did, did not comprehend that you could have a dispute with your employer. So the one of the comments that they had is that if you are in, and this was a conflict affected country, um, they understood that if you have a problem with the employer, it's just a problem. So this is not actually a dispute that you're going to fight or uh, against your employer, going to take him to justice. Um, so this is some things, this is a very radical example, and this was in a very small part of that specific country. But these are the things that when you're adapting the, the survey to your country, you need to be discussed idea with the civil society organization, the other organization that they can help frame and see if there's anything that needs to be regrouped or better explained. So once we have this question, then we ask the type of mechanism, which is what you see now. So we have this type of mechanism and like the previous question as well, it can't be adjusted. So we have both formal and informal. Some cases you might have more informal so uh, if what you do in the data collection, then you uh, ask more, you, you have more categories asking, and then you regroup these answers in the other formal or on the community or other practices. Being that it is important that we harmonize globally, but it's also very important that we are able to compute the, the indicator in a way that's useful for the member states. So in the way that's useful to you and to your uh, data analysis. So once we have those elements, we have a third element, which is uh, not here, the, the specific question, which is self exclude So for computed, we have all the number of who experienced a dispute during the past month and who have access, and then we divide it by those who have uh, experienced but were sex self excluded. What self excluded means is that when we are trying to measure access to justice, uh, in this case, for this dispute, we have to recognize that not everyone who has experienced a dispute has the necessity to actually access the judicial system. So you can, one of the possible reasons that you have experienced a dispute, a dispute with, for instance, with your employer but you are not, uh, you have enough knowledge on your legal rights, on the procedures, that you do not need uh, any other mechanism to help you in resolving this dispute. So in this case, we, we cannot say you have, we have not accessed, but there's a reason that you have not asked. And this reason is on the fact that you uh, do not need this, this, uh, this mechanism. So these are computed outside of the indicator. Um, now, once having this uh, indicator is very, very important to be to, to for it to be segregated as possible. So what you have there, and I hope it's not small too small for you to see. So on the SDG 16 survey, we have all of those indicators that we see. Sorry. <laughs> You have all of these indicators that you see, including 1633. For 1633, it is recommended that you have a, a segregation by sex, by age, by income, by disability, by certain population groups that might be vulnerable in your population. And there are certain specific segregations as well that the survey recommends. Uh, the population groups, this is because we recognize that not all population groups in some countries will have the same access. Some end up being having impediments to access the, the judicial system. So if, when possible, and once, uh, when your sample allows, it's good to try to uh, 
see exactly how is this access to, to justice for this group compared to the access to justice for your uh, population. Uh, you can see there's other, other segregation. And when uh, speaking of the survey again, if you do the survey as a standalone, this is what I was presented on the first webinar, then you also can um, try to analyze this indicator together at the indicators and see other factors. Uh, you can uh, try to analyze it with uh, the bribery, for instance, indicator 1651, which is, you know, this is a custodian or the satisfaction of public. You can have, in analyzing with the indicator, have a broader understanding of the several factors around uh, that specific indicators. So several reasons have been used to actually implement this indicator. Um, I'm going just to give you two examples before my colleague uh, from Tunisia goes through a more thorough uh, explanation of their experience. So for uh, Colombia, they created this index uh, on access to justice. And it was to try to compare the capacity on access. So to see between the different, uh, different parts. For El Salvador, it was to, to actually try to identify, this was inside the mediation program, try to identify and strategize. Those are the, the um, dispute resolution mechanisms that are accessed to the, by the population and adjust the, their own operations accordingly. So to adjust their own workflows. So this was published in 2021. So, and it served specifically to inform this program. There are several other reasons to measure the indicator. So this besides the obvious, uh, just to track the SDGs, but there are several reasons that they are related to the actual uh, your actual uh, priorities, national priority, national strategies. And I believe I have reached my 15 minutes of time. So thank you so much. And I'll be very happy to respond to any questions. And if you have any, any questions on the 63, both myself, you know, DC, myself as UNDP, you know, DC and OECD, we'd be very pleased to respond and to support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariana. It was an excellent presentation in 15 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I am now uh, honored to give the floor uh, to Ms. Uh, Gofran uh, Ajimi, planning, monitoring, and reporting expert who works for UNDP Tunisia. Ms. Uh, Gofran, please, uh, you are free to share your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, where you uh, you are. I'm uh, very glad to, to share with you uh, today the Tunisian experience related to SDG 16. And um, with focusing on um, the uh, indicator 16.33. Uh, uh, I uh, will start by uh, presenting. Are you seeing my screen before, please? Yes, we can see one slide, yes. Okay. So I will start by uh, giving you an overview about the Tunisian experience, the whole experience with SDG 16, who uh, started since uh, 2014. Now uh, we uh, conducted three, um, three national governance, peace and security survey in 2014, 17, and 21. The main actors who uh, are working on SDG 16 indicators are the presidency of the government of Tunisia, the uh, National uh, Statistic Institute, many technical partners, I mentioned here UNDP and other uh, UN uh, agencies, without forgetting um, organization of uh, civil uh, society. The work on SDG 16, as presented by uh, colleagues before, indicator related to uh, justice, um, is uh, conducted specially uh, through the portfolio SDG 16. Um, 
that um, um, uh, that present a big and many uh, activities and uh, actions um, through uh, the uh, national partners and uh, UNDP to produce data related to SDG 16 and also to use this uh, uh, data. After um, more uh, than um, nine years on working on uh, SDG uh, 16, uh, we uh, have an availability data now in 2023 uh, around 62.6%. Uh, now I will move to uh, data collection related to uh, SDG 16.33. In Tunisia, we, uh, we, we are working on two levels. The first level is the national level, and the second is the local or sub-national level. In the national level, as I mentioned, we uh, conducted three uh, surveys. From uh, 2014 and 2017, we, uh, we looked to uh, access to justice through uh, criminality and the trust, as Mariana said before. In uh, 2021, uh, the um, Governance, Peace and Security Survey was conducted in a special uh, context. It was after uh, COVID and also after the uh, pilot uh, SDG 16 uh, survey. And here we introduced the uh, indicator 16.33, excuse me, with uh, a series of questions related to the experience since two uh, years with despite, the type of despite, the reason, uh, to uh, go and to use mechanism, formal or informal uh, mechanism, and the reason to don't use this uh, mechanism. And we still uh, ask uh, about uh, a trust. In the national level, especially in the region of Midnin, Midnin is a town in the south of uh, Tunisia. We conducted uh, a series of, uh, uh, of um, survey, one survey related to access to justice, another to uh, cohesion, uh, uh, social cohesion, and uh, the pilot survey SDG 16. And I will focus on the pilot uh, survey uh, SDG 16 uh, that was our uh, reference uh, to, um, to start another experience uh, in uh, in analyzing that I will uh, share with you uh, uh, in a few uh, minutes. Now uh, I come to uh, results. I choose to share with you uh, the two uh, levels to see how it's important to uh, use these two levels. In the national level, as you, uh, you are seeing now, 5.4% have experienced it despite since two, uh, two years. More than 86% uh, of them have used a formal or informal uh, despite resolution uh, mechanism to solve this despite. When we move now to the uh, sub-regional level, we have 46% uh, who have experienced and use a formal or informal mechanism to solve the despite. Now, uh, population from Tunisia, when they faced despite where they go. They go in the national level to the cart, to the carts, same thing in the subnational level. Then uh, they uh, go to lawyer. In the uh, sub, uh, sub uh, national level, we go to local authorities. And finally, to uh, the police by uh, the same rate. This is just a, uh, an example of. Um, some, uh, some results regarding to uh, this indicator. When we produce data, why now we produce this data? What we will do with uh, this uh, data and how um, different beneficiaries or different um, institutional and civil society can use this data. We experience um, a way of using this evidence related to uh, the whole SDG 16 indicators. And we continue working on the two levels. 
we started this experience with analyzing uh, data, statistic data uh, related to SDG 16. Firstly, in the local level after conducting SDG 16 pilot survey. What we did, we created two groups separately, a national one, uh, excuse me, an, an institutional one composed of uh, public authorities and another composed by civil society. The first group was uh, working on producing a policy brief related to each pillar of SDG 16. One of these pillars was justice, and one of the indicators was 1633. The second group, using the same material, such as result of SDG pilot survey and some uh, other survey conducted in the region, and they worked to produce a, a spotlight report. After that, the two groups was regrouped around one table to conduct a policy dialogue. In fact, what they produced by the end, they, they identified problem related to uh, this indicator, and they tried to find a solution by presenting a list of recommendations. When we use the same data, both of a group who are different, because the first group is representing public authorities, the second civil society, but they uh, produce similar uh, recommendation or recommendation that they can be uh, complemented between each other. The policy dialogue was conducted in, in Medin. It, by this policy dialogue, we create a space of dialogue between authority and civil uh, society to agree on uh, some of, uh, of this recommendation. In, uh, in Medin, after uh, policy uh, dialogue, we, uh, we worked on uh, an action plan, and I shared on the screen some of recommendation proposed by both institutional uh, group and uh, civil, uh, civil society. This same experience was conducted on the national level based on result of a governance, peace and security survey conducted on 2021. All this group, the two groups on national level and on local level was focused on a problem of trust to access to justice. And they uh, presented solution in, in this way, like digitalization, uh, reviewing legal uh, ad system, uh, facilitating procedure, and, and many others. After uh, producing action plan in uh, subnational level, we uh, used another way to socialize data socialize more SDG uh, 16 and to, uh, to try to present this result not only to civil society and institutions, but also to population directly. And we used uh, Augusto Ball's theater. All uh, person you see here on my screen are uh, representing the two groups of institutional and uh, civil society, they uh, presented the result of their work to uh, a big number of uh, people from different ages, from different uh, social um, classes. And uh, this speak actors contributed by the end to uh, understand, analyze, and agree on some difficulties uh, faced on using or solving uh, despite and uh, improving uh, using of, uh, of data uh, to uh, help more decision. By the end, throughout this exercise, what we, what we did, we produced data, we analyzed data, and also we improve capacity of public authorities and civil society to be familiar more and more with statistics uh, 
to be yes, uh, Jimmy, sorry to cut you uh, could you please wrap up we are running out of time sorry i uh, i consume my 10 minutes uh, yes it seems to be yes Okay, excuse me. I finished by, by that. Okay. Uh, okay. So you can read the blog related to using theater if you uh, like to uh, socialize and localize more uh, SDG 16 indicators. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jimmy. It was a really, really great and complete presentation about UNDP experience in Tunisia. Um, uh, now, uh, dear colleagues, um, we are going to uh, go further in the questions. So it seems to be to to that we have uh, some questions. Uh, I would like to to transmit one question for our colleague Jisoo uh, to conduct the survey in our country. Can we get a model questionnaire of ICVS? Uh, dear Jisoo, could you please be able to respond? Yeah, yeah, of course. ICVS questionnaire actually are available online, and also UNODC and other like UN entities has like various of experience of fourteen countries conducting the uh, victim identity survey. So we also have other types of like me uh, questionnaire model. So please feel free to reach out. So if you like request some kind of example or other resources, yeah, I will yeah share. Of course, yeah, please uh, contact us. Sorry. Yep, over to you. Um, thank, thank you, Jisoo, yeah, uh, for this response. A uh, second question that uh, we have still to, to reply is addressed to uh, Gulnar. Uh, I know that, Gulnar, you may have responded, but we would like to hear from you uh, to all the audience. So the question is, how did the COVID pandemic affect your survey method with potential respondents in Uzbekistan? Uh, Ms. Gulnar, if you could uh, respond, it would be great. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, it, it is a bit affected and we had to conduct paper-based uh, interview because it, initially we uh, were planning to conduct um, computer-based interview to go to the respondents with uh, laptops uh, and with tablets. And that's why, yes, it's affected. And by our opinion, of course, it is a lesson learned for us. And uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, I would like to recommend you if you uh, would like to increase efficiency of your surveys, recommend you to do computer-based or even interview or telephone-based interview, because we notice that when uh, respondents respond by the telephone or on the through the web, they are more open. Uh, and um, you will have more effective crime statistics. Thank you very much, colleagues. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Gunnar, to, to respond to this question. Uh, dear participants, we are uh, a bit out of time, <laughs> running out of time. Uh, we still have some questions, but we the other ones will be transmitted to our SDG 16 hub which is a platform where we'll, we, we can uh, respond to the remaining questions and uh, by our experts uh, later on. Uh, now, uh, we would like to share with you two questions uh, to think about for uh, our next session on next Thursday. Uh, the topic of our next session uh, is accountable, effective, and inclusive uh, public institutions. So the first one is... Uh, if uh, administrative recalls might be cost efficient, but also pose particular challenges in organizing and processing the data, what challenges have you experienced in trying to compile statistics on public service and on the judiciary? And the second is surveys require considerable investment from all actors. What support would your country or countries in general require to implement surveys to collect information on access to justice, corruption, uh, discrimination, Govern, governance, human trafficking, and violence, please, please feel free to also share your best practices. Uh, we kindly encourage you to engage with other participants we, via the SG16 hub by posting additional questions, reply on this question, and share feedback. Um, dear participants, today's webinar on promoting uh, the rule of law and access to justice has reached an end. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the participants, all the speakers, and all uh, the organizing agencies, um, please come back uh, next week for our fourth webinar out of six 
which will be focusing on accountable, effective, and inclusive public institutions. We look for we look forward to see you again. Um, before saying goodbye, please be reminded that you'll be able to find all the recording and presentation on the SDG 16 Hub. If you have any question uh, or comment, you can always contact us at uh, unodc-corset.coe.atun.org. Uh, please also feel free to follow us on Twitter uh, on UNODC Corset Center of Excellence in Asia Pacific. I will now close this training by saying good afternoon to everyone from my office. It has been an honor for me to be the moderator today. Thank you, everyone. See you next week in our next webinar on accountable, effective, and inclusive public institutions. Goodbye.